of every perceived slight against white people. But really, you should know uh, what's going on here. You should know what actually is going on here. Because this is what Alex is turning into all whites are terrorists. There's more. The original article at the center of this whole thing, like I said, was Mark Potok responding to a video put out by James Yeager. And once you realize who James Yeager is, everything comes into focus. Yeager is the CEO of Tactical Response, a company that sells weapons, weapon parts, and training. They're also a sponsor of Alex's show. Yeager's been on the show many times, and Alex sells parts from his site, uh, on his website. Or at least he definitely did in the past, I'm not sure if he still does. That relationship is mysteriously undisclosed in Alex's commentary about Mark Potok, the LA Times, all of this. Nonsense. No, not okay. No, that's just not okay. How is that a thing? How is that a thing that can happen? I feel like that... There are so many things that aren't illegal and that I don't know how to police correctly. It really shouldn't be possible. Yeah, I mean, what you have, what you have is like a level of isolation, a level of. Uh, and, you know, there's an intent. Absolutely. So Mark Potok is the uh, guy who worked at the SPLC Center, who was behind the report that the LA Times article is based on. So it's yeah. the root of all of this stuff. Gotcha. And Mark Potok's article that he wrote for Salon, that was an extension of this, uh, uh, this commentary is about James Yeager. This, this explicit connection uh, between this all being about people explicitly threatening to kill people right. if there's any gun control measures passed. Um, so it, it's just, you've got a cart and horse situation right. that's, that's completely, Alex is forgetting about what's actually behind the, the chicken and egg, uh, if you will, you know, the, whatever the cause and effect is. He's ignoring the cause, talking about the effect as if it exists in a vacuum. Right. And it's abusive. It's, it's, a, it's a manipulative strategy that I think is bullshit. <laughs> and he only does this when it's issues about white people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the, he thinks that white gun owners should be able to threaten to kill people uh, with no consequences. And that way they can terrorize them into doing whatever they want. Yeah. You know, he, he's, a, he's a terrorist. Well, what's really, <laughs> what's really interesting about this is that Alex, uh, because of the L.A. Times article, the Mark Podock uh, on Slimeball, uh, yeah, the, uh, because of all that, Alex is making a big prediction. In this next clip, we will see. Um, and it's pretty extreme, and I think I understand what's going on. They've got all these movies coming out where, you know, militias attack the White House. So they can stage a false flag, have it be incredibly immoral, what happens, blow up a nursery like Oklahoma City, whatever, and then blame it on that. So, impeachment. I mean, holy sh**, right? If you want to know WTF is going on right now, wherever you listen. What's emotionally abusing my audience? I'm Robert Evans, uh, the host of the show where I emotionally abuse my audience. Is that a good intro, Sophie? It's no? the honest one. It's the honest one. That is what this show is about. And I love being technically honest. Like, last episode, I promised that I was not going to throw any more bagels. But then our wonderful sound guy, Chris, handed me an English muffin, which also fits in my sling. So I am going to throw an English muffin at some point this episode. I'm way less angry about that than I was about that moldy bagel. Yeah, there's no mold. <laughs> this is a solid English muffin. Yeah, I'm going to have to eat it after. Yeah, I was going to say, don't be wasteful. You have to eat it. I'll you have to eat, eat the entire thing. I will. After I throw it. Great. Maybe slightly before I throw it. Pieces of it. Can you give a little bit piece of the tan or something? A little piece. Yeah, Mike just could come close enough to him that he's able to get it himself. Em, we clarified this. Anderson's a woman. How dare you? <laughs> I'm sorry for misgendering Anderson. But in my defense, dogs are incapable of caring about gender. Anderson. It's one of their best traits. I, she does pee with her leg up, so. <laughs> dogs are post gender. All dogs are both male and female. Like I said, she does pee with her leg exactly. on it. Exactly. Her name is Anderson. We could learn a lot from dogs, namely about peeing everywhere. Anderson doesn't pee everywhere. She She's could. a classy broad. There's nothing not classy about peeing wherever you want. In a 
a lot of ways, that's the classiest thing you can do. We are really off on a tangent here that is not productive for the show. Um, it has nothing to do with your topic. Nothing to do with my topic. I just this one out because I'm perfect. Mm-hmm. That was a smart play because I wasn't canceled before. <laughs> I'm just just barreling towards cancellation. So today we're going to talk about Jerry Falwell Jr. and Liberty University. Now this is going to run on a different week than our other Falwell episodes because we're talking about a different Falwell. But we are recording this just minutes after the last one. So you have had a full Falwell dose. How are you feeling? Say Might that. you be full well? Yay. I said we call it a day. That's probably the... I'm also uh, canceled. Yeah. <laughs> it happens really quick. <laughs> Very quickly. And yet, does not change what we're doing at all, which really actually does get to the core of what cancel culture actually is. People declare you canceled and then nothing happens. Cool. In our previous two episodes on Jerry Falwell Sr., I think I was pretty clear in my opinion that he was a piece of shit. His life made the world a worse place, and we'd be better off if his dad had accidentally shot him when he was pranking one of his friends. However, I should acknowledge that there are some things about him you have to grudgingly respect. For one thing, he built a legitimately impressive and expansive organization that grew from a small church of 70 into an empire that spoke for millions and organized an entirely new political bloc that now dominates American politics. That's impressive, even if it's shitty. You also have to acknowledge that Jerry Falwell was a true believer. He was deeply consistent throughout his life, and everything we know about his personal life suggests that he lived in a consistent manner with his terrible values. And that's not good, but you might argue it's better than pushing all of those same terrible agendas and, say, getting wasted at nightclubs in Miami. Which is the story we're about to tell. I was going to say, is, was that foreshadowing? It is foreshadowing. That is foreshadowing. Jerry Lamont Falwell Jr. was born on June seventeenth, nineteen sixty-two. So he got another cool middle name. He got the Lamont. Lamont. He got the Lamont. I yeah. love me that. Yeah, yeah. Well, otherwise he wouldn't be a junior. If you give a different middle name, then you're not a junior, right? I don't, I don't know, know how that works. I think that's junior law. Uh, his parents sent him to private schools in and around Lynchburg so he could be raised in a world of God and without black people around, uh, rather than the world of Satan. In 1971, he watched from the vantage point of a pew at the Thomas Road Baptist Church while his father explained to the congregants his plan to start a Christian university in Lynchburg. Jerry Sr. explained that the new college would produce champions for Christ. Jerry Falwell Jr. would one day become the master of that institution. But first, he was a student there. After graduating from Lynchburg Christian Academy, he attended Liberty University starting in 1980, the same year the moral majority began its massive push for the election of Ronald Reagan. From what I can find, Jerry Falwell Jr. did not have his father and grandfather's appetite for mean-spirited pranks. So that's a plus. I mean, I wonder how many times as a child you have to see your dad like wilding out by like yeah. shooting some people or hitting them someone over. cats or yeah, <laughs> pretending to run people over where you're like, you know what, I'm going to decide not to be much of a prankster. Yeah, he, he, he never got to see his granddad, so he didn't meet. He never saw the cat feeders. It's crazy. Like, when you're reading a whole book about Jerry Falwell, you don't notice some of these things, but in retrospect, the fact that anyone would call murdering someone's cat and feeding it to them a prank prank is so fucked. That's not a prank. Like, that is a seriously demented, psychologically unsound crime. Yeah, that's evidence that somebody is probably chopping up, like, people in their spare time. Yeah, like, they're they're one one more cat away from just yeah. people. Fucking wild. Now, uh, Jerry Falwell Jr. got his bachelor's degree in religious studies and history. After acquiring a letter of recommendation from Senator Ted <coughs> Kennedy, of all people, Jerry Jr. was accepted to the University of Virginia School of Law. Again. I thought that was for Liberty University. I'm like, isn't that his dad's school? No. Why did he even need a recommendation? He wanted to go Ted to Kennedy. School. Oh. That yeah. makes sense, I guess. And again, as with Ted Kennedy, as with all these guys, mostly what they care about is that they're all rich. So even if they have political disagreements, they'll still do a solid for their rich friends' kids. So that's nice. Cool. Cool. 
Jerry Jr.'s brother, Jonathan, took a different path. From the beginning, he was more drawn to religion than his brother. Jonathan became an ordained reverend. He took over his father's position, leading the Thomas Road Baptist Church. While Jerry Jr. has inherited the bulk of his dad's empire and passion for direct political involvement, Jonathan has kept strictly to religion. He did not endorse Donald Trump alongside his brother in 2016. That's a small mercy. That's a small mercy. Prior to his death in 2007, Jerry Falwell Sr. had laid out his plans for the inheritance of his empire of faith. I'm going to quote now from a massive article on the Falwells in Politico by Brandon Ambrosino, himself a Liberty University grad. His two sons, Jerry Jr. and Jonathan, had each inherited different aspects of their father's persona. For Jerry Jr., the elder of the two by four years, it was the stomach for partisan politics, ability to throw an elbow and savvy to court influential friends. For Jonathan, it was the calling to ministry, his easy way with people and charisma as a public speaker. Jerry Jr. would preside over Liberty University, and Jonathan would lead Thomas Road Baptist Church. So that's cool. And from a financial perspective, this seems to have been a great call. When Falwell Jr. took over the college, it had assets of roughly $259 million. Two years later, it held assets worth more than $2.5 billion. It is now worth more than $3 billion. So that's cool. Wow. Yeah. I mean, you gotta give it to him. He's better at business than Donald Trump was. Yeah, but it's like, isn't such a huge part of being a good Christian as like giving to the poor? How are you going to get all the way to three billion? Well, that, there's really different attitudes on that within the faith. So there's the people who are so like... in the rich community. Yeah, yeah there the, the is. the community of rich Christians where it's yeah. like, no, the more money you accumulate, that's God's blessings that you're accumulating. And so yeah. Jerry Falwell is... Because that's how blessings work. You just pile them all up. At least that's consistent with their attitudes towards AIDS. Ta-da! Yay! What a wonderful belief system. So lucky. So cool. Yay. So, uh, now I bet you're wondering, what did, what did, what did, what did Jerry Falwell Jr. do to increase the value of his university by so much in such a short period of time? I was thinking that. You wondering if there was anything gross and shady there? Yeah, yeah, I was wondering that. Much of Liberty University's growth has been due to growth in online students under Falwell Jr.'s reign. There are now 95,000 kids across the country taking Liberty University courses from their homes. So that's good. No, I mean, if I know one thing, it's that online universities... Are never scammy. Are never literally just scams. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. And we're going to talk about that in a second. But before we talk about that, I want to talk a little bit about Falwell Jr.'s wife, Becky. Oh my god, he with really an literally met a married a Becky with, with an, an eye. eye. Yeah. There's a little heart over that eye, I can feel it. And I can, I will, I, I know in my bones that she has had a lot of issues with a lot of waiters and waitresses. Oh Talked yeah. Talked to a lot of managers in her <laughs> yeah. day. Yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, and part of why I know this is what I'm about to read next, his wife Becky is considered by many close to the family to have taken on a major role in managing the university since Jerry Sr.'s death. One former school official told Ambrosino, writing for Politico, until Big Jerry, that's what they called him, died, you wouldn't have known Becky if she walked up and slapped you. Big Jerry dies, and all of a sudden, if you're walking down the hall and you didn't greet her right, you're fired. This official shared a 2012 email from Becky to four school executives. In the email, she complains about a school employee who complained on Facebook that the university didn't have enough parking spaces. Someone needs to talk to this girl, Becky wrote. I don't think that we allow employees to post negative remarks about liberty. Wow, real yeah. Nazi kind of flair. Yeah, and apparently the employee uh, ended their employment there not long after. She spoke to the manager and she got him fired. Yeah, yeah. Be Becky's complaint sparked an almost immediate call to the employee at the employee's home at 9 p.m. Because she uh, complained about not enough parking. Now, wow, what a bitch. That's going to be fairly minor compared to what else we're talking about today, but it's just so petty that I felt compelled to point it out. Now, in another article published by a former student uh, in the News Advance, talked about sort of how the culture on Liberty University's campus has changed since Jerry Falwell Sr.'s death. It's titled, Inside Liberty University's Culture of Fear. It's a good title. The author, Will Young, was formerly the editor-in-chief of Liberty University School newspaper, The Champion. He claims he instantly got in trouble during his first week there. His crime was noticing that his school's police department didn't publish a daily crime log online. He called the Virginia Association of Campus Law Enforcement Administrators to ask that this was against the law. The university police department found out and complained to his boss, who yelled at him. He writes, 
This wasn't exactly a rude awakening. I'd spent the previous three years watching the university administration, led by President Jerry Falwell Jr., meddle in our coverage, revise controversial op-eds, and protect its image by stripping damning facts from our stories. Still, I stuck around. I thought that I had a little discretion and kept my head down. I did one day win enough trust from the university to protect the integrity of our journalism. I even dreamed we could eventually persuade the administration to let the champion go independent from its supervision. I was naive. Instead, when my team took over that fall in 2017, we encountered an oversight system that required us to send every story to Falwell's assistant for review. Any administrator or professor who appeared in an article had editing authority over any part of that article. They added and deleted whatever they wanted. Falwell called our newsroom on multiple occasions to direct our coverage personally, as he had a year earlier when, weeks before the 2016 election, he read a draft of my column defending mainstream news outlets in order me to say who I plan to vote for. I refused on ethical grounds, so Falwell told me to insert author refused to reveal which candidate he is supporting for president at the bottom of my reports. <coughs> this wasn't exactly a rude awakening. I spent the previous three years watching the university administration led by President Jerry Falwell Jr. meddle in our coverage, revise controversial op-eds, and protect its image by stripping damning facts from our stories. Still, I stuck around. I thought that I would really scratch and have my head down. Nazi propaganda qualities. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it is consistent with the family line of hating freedom of speech and yeah. not being able to stand anybody saying anything bad about you. I guess that is passed down in the genes, um, and pranks apparently aren't. So, we've learned a lot about genetics today. Will eventually quit the school paper, and the School of Communication did not replace him with a new editor in chief. Instead, they changed the champion to a faculty run paper, taking control for content direction entirely away from the students. Future journalists at Liberty University were forced to sign an NDA forbidding them from talking about editorial or managerial direction, oversight decisions, or information designed as privileged or confidential. The NDA also makes student journalists acknowledge that they are privileged to get thoughts, opinions, and other statements from university administration. <laughs> We're so lucky wow. that people talk to us. Yeah, that's cool. So obviously Will is a student with an axe to grind, but his experiences gel very clearly with the reporting of numerous other journalists, as well as complaints of students and alumni. He and others paint a picture of Liberty University as a sort of evangelical dictatorship of higher learning. Which is super neat. Uh, a dictatorship of higher learning? Yeah. Yeah. Sounds dreamy. Yeah where the entire university is just an extension of Jerry Falwell Jr.'s personality and pocketbook. Um, that sounds like a good thing for a school to be. Sounds like a good education. I'm glad they don't have to pay taxes. <laughs> yeah, that would be crazy. Yeah, if they had to pay taxes. Well, because they're an apolitical religious institution that demands their writers publish who they... Only flattering yeah. things. Yeah. Now, a lot of the uh, 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 changes in the culture of Liberty University are believed to have something to do with what has made the school so enormously profitable since Jerry Jr. took over the massive growth of their online education program. By 2015, Liberty <laughs> University was the second largest provider of online education in the United States, second only to the University of Phoenix. I was going to guess Phoenix was yeah. leading. Yeah, it's number one. Number two is Liberty U. The school can largely thank the federal government for the money that it's gotten on as a result of this. By 2017, Liberty students received more than $772 million per year from the Department of Education. It ranks sixth in federal aid nationwide. The vast majority of Liberty University's wealth comes from taxpayer dollars. Yay! And they don't have to pay taxes. So um, that's good. You guys feel good about your, where your taxes are going? I feel good. great about it. They need a billion dollars a year. It's not upsetting at all. Flint, Michigan doesn't need... Clean water. Clean water, but Liberty University needs $772 million uh, to discriminate against students. So fucked of, up. Yeah. Of 
variety of types. Yeah, it's, it's cool. Super cool and consistent. Some people find it uncomfortable or downright bad that a school which bans its students from supporting homosexuality, swearing, and even drinking off campus receives federal money. But as we all know, evangelical Christians in America don't have to obey the same rules as the rest of us, and that's fine. It's fine. Everybody's happy with this. That's what Jesus was for. That's what Jesus was for. Massive inequality. He was a big fan of inequality. I mean, I would say that was his platform. Mm -hmm. Trickle-down economics, mm -hmm. he was a big fan of, right? Yeah, oh yeah, 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 I remember when, uh, Jesus... When he was like, oh, I'll turn one fish, well, you know what, I'm just gonna take this I'm one just fish. i take this fish. It's gonna eventually trickle down to yeah. the really hungry people. I'm gonna throw some bones at y'all. Someone of you's gonna get an eye, a fish eye, and you will be fucking happy with yeah. it. Yeah, and you will be my second in command. <laughs> Jesus. So, uh, online courses have become the primary money-generating engine behind Liberty University. They have more than 300 phone recruiters working from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., calling students from lists they get from sites like Best Colleges Online. In an article breaking this down, the New York Times noted, There is such a race to get to customers before the University of Phoenix and other rivals that the prospective students sometimes marvel at how little time has elapsed, just a handful of minutes, between their providing their information on a website and the call coming from Liberty. Liberty's tax filings show that, in 2016, the university paid Google $16.8 million for admissions leads generation. In other words, advertising Liberty to those searching online for degree options. The recruiters work under intense pressure. According to several former LUO employees I spoke with, they get no more than 45 seconds between calls, and sometimes managers override even that short break. There are no formal quotas. A federal regulation that went into effect in 2011 forbids them. But as one former employee put it, the highly motivated goal is for each recruiter to sign up eight new students a day. Multiply to class 300 cubicles, that is 2,400 per day. Um, 45 seconds between calls. I mean, honestly, that's downright leisurely. Yeah, what are they even complaining lazy. about? Exactly. Um, Slobs. So it sounds like it's just like a big MLM kind of situation. Yeah, it's uh, akin to that, certainly. I mean, it's a, yeah, it's, um... Not an MLM, but what do they call it when it's just like a, a farm? Yeah, it's a diploma mill. Yeah. Yeah. It's a diploma mill masquerading as a religious institution so it doesn't have to pay taxes. But the hundreds of millions of dollars it gets from taxpayers. But the particularly aggressive sales call thing? Yeah. That's like its own thing, right? Yeah, yeah, it's like, it's like telemarketing. Yeah. Yeah. But and that's like crazy that it's so high pressure. Yeah, well, they're fucking Glenn Gary, Glenn Rossing these people. Yeah, yeah, to get them into debt. So that, like, to get them into taxpayers' subsidized debt to the school for a degree which, spoilers, is not worth a whole lot. Mm. But you know it is worth a whole lot, Sophia. Our goods and services? Yes. Ta-da! You let her say goods. I did let her say goods. <laughs> I, I, I nice gave it up. I'm Robert Evans, host of Behind the Bastards. And, you know, as part of my practice for this show, I have to go through a lot of books to learn about all these terrible people I teach you about. And, you know, I have spent time on the road, I spent time at the gym. I wouldn't be able to do all the research I do if it weren't for audiobooks and Audible. They make it easy to get informed and learn while you're listening, so you can do it wherever you happen to be. And right now, for a limited time, you can get three months of Audible for just six ninety five a month. That's more than half off the regular price. And you're going to get two Audible originals and one audiobook absolutely free when you sign up. If you want a recommendation from me, try The Court of the Red Tsar, which is one of the very best books written about Joseph Stalin. The audiobook is engaging and fun and, you know, 27 and a half hours, so you'll have a lot of time to do bench reps or whatever while you listen. So, if you want to try out Audible for six ninety five a month, you can go to audible.com slash behind or just text behind to 500-500. That's audible.com slash behind or text behind to 500-500. We're back. Why are you waving that? I am waving... Threateningly waving an English muffin. It's attached to a sling, though. I'm excited. So he's excited. Proud, too. Excited and proud. On with the episode. 
Of course, you don't sign up new students at that kind of rate without fudging or obscuring a few facts. This is what you were getting at a little bit, Sophia. Two recruiters told the Times that they were ordered to quote the university's cost on a per-credit basis instead of per course. Instructors are also urged to not push students on how good their grades were in high school. Any GPA over .5 is enough to qualify you for Liberty University. <laughs> Point five? Do you even have to be conscious to get that? <laughs> no. Point, point five is like if you guess on literally everything, including the essay, you'll you'll get a point five. Jeez. Yeah. The good news for those D students is that Liberty's online courses are not exactly famous for their rigor. From the New York Times. People know it's kind of a joke and don't learn that much from it, Dustin Wall, a senior from South Dakota, told me. You use Google when you take your quiz and you don't have to work as hard. It's pretty obvious. Liberty says using Google during quizzes or exams is cheating. Wow. Yeah. The Times reporting suggests that recruiters have even started obscuring the school's Christian orientation in order to suck in more sweet tax dollars. I mean students. Quote, Two recruiters also said they were told not to mention Liberty's Christian orientation until people agree to apply. When this fact is made clear in the user agreement, they sign online. It also becomes clear at the moment that the recruiters sign up students for their first classes, typically an orientation class and three required Bible studies classes. Students often can't transfer credits for these courses to other colleges, which deters many from dropping out. So, if you're keeping track, this school, which is funded primarily by taxpayer dollars, trick students into signing up without knowing that they're joining a Christian university. And, and then, then if they try to leave it devalue, it doesn't transfer anywhere so they can't really go. And then there's mandatory Bible classes that are paid for, again, with taxpayer dollars. This is cool. Fuck. Now, this all obviously has not made, uh, Makes all... me miss Trump University, you know? Oh, there was a university. Uh, you knew what you were getting with Trump University. Yeah. A picture with a cardboard cut out of Donald Trump and nothing else. I miss them. I miss them, too. Now, uh, Liberty University's teachers are not all happy with the state of affairs that has changed. Because it used to be a somewhat actual yeah, school. Yeah, I was going to say there's teachers. Because it really doesn't seem like it. That seems to be the administration's attitude, too. There's teachers? <laughs> <laughs> we thought the scam just ran itself after we suckered you into... Getting in. That is, yeah, we'll, we'll be getting a quote from Jerry Falwell Jr. that's basically that. Uh, see, most teachers like to know that they work for a well-respected university rather than a profit mill with very little to no educational benefit. But Liberty University is ranked in the lowest one quarter of national universities by U.S. News & World Report. It lags behind Brigham Young University, a religious college that ah. at least delivers an education. Low-quality online courses might be one reason for this. Another is probably the university's outright hatred of its teachers. Only the law school at Liberty University even offers a ten-year track. This allows Jerry Falwell, Jr., to enact an extreme degree of control over his faculty because he can fire absolutely anyone. However, this also makes it difficult to draw in competent teachers. Chris Galmer, a former English professor, provides additional explanation for this treatment. When I was there, at faculty meetings, the commentary was that online was funding the school while they were trying to just break even on the residential side. And it was understood that on the online side, they were making a killing. Boy. Cool. Sounds like a real school to me. In his interview with the New York Times, Falwell Jr. admitted that the faculty had complained initially about the growing importance of online classes. He told them, the big victory was finding a way to tame the faculty. <laughs> we really started making money when we fucking... Tame the faculty? Yeah. What are they, fucking tigers? What is going on? Yeah, yeah, you, you gotta tame the faculty, otherwise they're going to complain about the fact that you aren't delivering an education to your students. Oh boy. Those pesky faculty. Jerry Falwell Jr.'s decision to endorse Donald Trump in the 2016 election was deeply controversial, both for the students and the teachers. According to Will's write-up, the school's methods became even more aggressive after Falwell endorsed Donald Trump early that year, according to multiple current and former faculty members. The closer you get to the president's office, says a former history professor, Brian Melton, discussing a chilling effect of the school, as it becomes. Falwell's staff now operates masterfully to squash challenges to his views and his rise in national political influence. So that's good. That's scary as hell. Yeah. This March, Falwell Jr. attended the signing of an executive order by President Trump on college free speech. Oh my Big god. Big advocate of college free speech. 
Oh, the irony is truly too much. Yeah, the guy who brought the school's paper under his direct personal control uh, is invited by President Trump to uh, watch the signing of a bill that I'm sure will protect free speech. It hurts. Yeah. In a PBS NewsHour appearance after, he claimed that his college was inclusive of all ideas, unlike all those evil liberal universities. As evidence for this, he pointed out that Liberty University invited President Carter to deliver its 2018 commencement address and had Bernie Sanders speak in 2015 at a mandatory assembly. These things did happen. But Falwell neglected to mention some other things, like the fact that, in 2009, it withdrew funding and recognition for the College Democrats Club. Mark Hine, the SVP of Student Affairs, said this was because the Democratic Party defends abortion and supports the LGBT agenda. Wow. So that's good. After the bloody 2017... Really reminiscent of his dad. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He, the apple did not fall far from the tree that is also poop and not apples. <laughs> and the apples are also poop. Yes, the apples were also poop. After the deadly 2017 Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, you know this is going to go a good oh place to like that, the Liberty Student Government Association attempted to issue a statement of solidarity with Heather Heyer, the murdered anti-fascist activist. In response to this, the SGA's president refused to release the statement because it would have meant sending it to Jerry Falwell Jr. first, and they really didn't think he was going to be on board with sympathizing with a woman murdered by a Nazi. Oh, God. Well, they're probably not wrong about that. That's why I said, oh, God. <laughs> When Falwell Sr. died, the idea was that Jonathan Falwell would act as the moral compass for Liberty University, while his brother handled the finances. And Jonathan is still the school's vice chancellor for spiritual affairs, but the evidence suggests that he has been largely sidelined at the university. One Liberty official told Brandon Ambrosino, writing for Politico, quote, Jerry never removed Jonathan, he just kind of pushed him aside. He bought all of the Thomas Road Baptist Church properties, Liberty Christian Academy, Jonathan's building at the airport, and a couple of others. Jonathan complained, but never stood up to Jerry because he knew Jerry controlled the purse strings. Seems like a healthy family. Jonathan seems sad as hell. I think Jonathan is kind of sad as hell. Yeah. I'd like to know what he does every day. Cry. Right? Yeah, yeah. Or, yeah. Terrible family. Yeah, it seems like a bummer of a family. And Falwell Jr. has done some strange things with his control of those purse strings. Things his father would not have approved of. One of these things was the $4.7 million purchase of a South Beach hostel in Miami, Florida. Doesn't sound, um, I don't know, Christian and decent. No, but it actually sounds like a pretty sweet hostel. Uh, very gay-friendly. Uh, situated directly above a liquor store with a bar where you could bring your own alcohol in. That's what I'm saying. How uh, could they have possibly allowed this? Well, that's a, that's a fun little story. Um, it listed its rules as no soliciting, fundraising, politics, salesman, or religion. It was written inside the hostel. That's fun. Owned by Jerry Falwell Jr. Uh, it was billed as a great place for people around the world to come and get wasted in pre-party before hitting the Miami Strip. So this is so confusing. Yeah. The Falwells bought the hostel, but mysteriously gave a 25% stake in its profits to one Giancarlo Granda. Now, Mr. Granda is most often described as a pool boy in reporting on this that you'll find. He is a handsome, muscular, uh, young man in his mid-twenties. The nature of his relationship to the Falwells is unclear, but he seems to have accompanied them on numerous trips. Some evidence suggests that he was present with the Falwells during the taking of some racy photos of Jerry Falwell Jr.'s wife, Betty. That's interesting. Wait. Yeah. What's the suggestion the, here? The suggestion is that Jerry Falwell Jr., his wife Becky, and this pool boy had an ongoing threesome thing happening, and then they bought this guy a hostel and gave him a 25% stake in the profits and let him manage it. A gay-friendly hostel. I was hoping that's what you would that say. That kind of seems like what's happening. That is delicious. Now... But hot pool boy is how he's described. He's usually just described as a pool boy. But you said he was hot. He's definitely hot. Oh yeah, no, you look him up. He's 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 scrumptious. I definitely mm. pictured the guy from Legally Blonde. Do you know what I'm talking about? Mm. Oh yeah, yeah, like the guy she's into, the stupid yeah, look looking. Him, look him up, Carlo Grand. He's a good looking guy. Mm. So freaky, I love it. Yeah, it's 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 pretty fun. Uh, I don't yeah. think Becky had it in her. No. Yeah, a lot of people know what Becky had in her because these pictures have gone. Pretty racy? Yeah, pretty racy. Now, 
The Falwells deny that there are any racy photos. Well, that's not quite what he says. Uh, in, in an interview with the Todd Stark radio show, Jerry Falwell Jr. said, there are no compromising or embarrassing photos of me. Yeah. But Becky. But Becky, yeah. Three photographs of Becky have been seen by the Miami Herald. Uh, they are images of her in various states of undress. It is not known who took the photos or when they were taken, and they given the photographs and therefore has not been able to authenticate them uh, independently. But two of the photos appear to have been taken at the Falwells Farm in Virginia, and a third at the Chica Lodge, where they were known to have spent a lot of time with Giancarlo Granda. Oh, shit. Yeah, 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 yeah. Can they freak on? Now, when these photos uh, leaked out, I mean... Who do you get to help you if you need to, like, recover some racy photos of your wife? Larry Flint. No. Michael Cohen. Uh, oh, my God. <laughs> that took a turn off. Yeah, he was a longtime friend of the Falwell family, and they hired him to clean up the evidence of these, uh, these sexy photo sets. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. From Politico. Longtime listener, first time caller, would love to clean this up for you. his wife.